Census Unit Care and Population Health. Um, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, next week is Stanford's Lean Conference. It is Wednesday and Thursday. You can still have to, uh, can, you can still register and we hope to see you there. Uh, the other announcement is the annual publication award is open for submissions. You saw a slide that had a QR code. The most recent uh, SMCI newsletter had uh, information on how to submit your publications. It will be announced in the next SMCI newsletter also, so plenty of opportunities to submit your publications um, up until November 6th. So you have a while to connect with your teams and figure out if you want to submit your uh, um, manuscripts, peer-reviewed publications. Um, and then to get to today's lecture, um, I want to welcome Dr. Heather uh, Gill Martin, who is the Associate Director of the Colorado Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, um, particularly the Dissemination and Implementation Research Core. Um, this core aims to build dissemination capacity across University of Colorado and their partner sites. Um, she's also a health research scientist at Veterans Health um, Administration in Denver um, at the Center of Innovation and is a clinical assistant professor at uh, University of Colorado uh, School of Public Health. Um, her presentation today is extension of a presentation I saw at Academy Health Dissemination and Implementation Science Conference last December. Um, and I was really excited because I feel like I could use this information um, more in-depthly and wanted to bring it here to share it all with you. But today she'll be talking about uh, beyond the report or manuscript, how to disseminate your work to new audiences. And with that, I'll hand it over to Heather. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is this is nice without the travel as well, which is added benefit. Um, so I am going to share my screen here and, and get started. Um, see here. Okay. And then Sam, if you don't mind um, keeping an eye on the chat, if anyone throws yeah. a question in there that you feel like should be asked, um, otherwise I will keep going. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I have developed sort of a, a passion around this idea of dissemination science, which was something I didn't even know about until I started my um, postdoctoral fellowship in the VA uh, based out of Denver. I didn't even know implementation and dissemination science was a thing. Now it is my passion. And so I look forward to sharing all this information with you all. Um, as, a, as a general overview for what I'm going to cover over the next 30 minutes or so um, is I'm going to start... Um, discussing why you should actively disseminate your, your research, your quality improvement work, and even your clinical practice information. Um, I'm then gonna introduce some dissemination tools and frameworks to guide your efforts. I will then end with tips and best practices uh, that we've learned from about two years um, of running a uh, dissemination consultation service for the Colorado Clinical Translational Sciences Institute, which I'm gonna shorten to CCTSI. Uh, at the end of this talk, I hope I've sold you on the idea of dissemination or at least nudged you a little bit closer to it and given you some practice tips on where you can start. So dissemination, it is an active tailored process of communication that is meant to spread information widely. This is different than implementation, which is when users learn about and start to use an innovation. And this is also different than diffusion, which is a passive process by which an innovation is communicated through channels over time. So the bedrock of scientific dissemination is to publish your quality improvement or your research or your clinical um, case studies in peer-reviewed academic journals. And the good news is there are so many to choose from. <laughs> As of 2020, there are 46 1,736 academic journals publishing papers worldwide. And over the last 10 years, the number of journals has grown at an average rate of about 2.5% every year. 
And this has resulted in at least 64 million academic papers being published since 1996. And an astonishing 5.1 million articles were published in 2022 alone, hopefully many of yours. Um, and, and this is a good thing because we're getting our science out there. But it's a bad thing because no one has time to keep up with their literature. So this figure shows the average number of articles reportedly read per year by university faculty members from 1977 to 2018. Um, in 2005, this group read about 275 articles a year, and it has been in a steady decline since then. To be honest, most academics do not read beyond the abstract. I could not find any data on um, reading rates for publicly available reports, um, but I do know that leaders in the government and in healthcare, uh, they will read a one page executive summary, right? Especially if there's like pictures and graphs but a lengthy report, probably not. So how do you make your work stand out, right? How do you get a fellow academic, a funder, or a community member to know about your work? So best practice is to think about who you wanna know, who do you think should know about your work? Where are they? And how best to get the content to them? If you wait, until your report or your paper is ready for print, you may not have the energy, uh, the money, right? The grant money's probably gone um, or the team left around to do proper dissemination. So that is why the science of dissemination was pulled together in the last you know, 18, 20 years to help give scientists some guidance on how to do this. So at my last count, there were 68 dissemination theories or models for you to choose from, which is a lot. And um, fortunately, there are very smart people out there trying to make this work easier, including some of my colleagues from the University of Colorado. So this group created the Dissemination and Implementation Models in Health Research and Practice web tool. And the, um, the web address is on the slide. The uh, interactive web tool will show you all the dissemination models currently part of the peer reviewed literature. Or you can select from a list that these national economic experts recommend for your area of interest. Once you find one that seems like it's a good fit, you can learn about how the model has been applied in different populations and in different settings. And you can also find measures associated uh, with the model. And the authors have a beautiful job of creating tutorials to help you navigate the website because it's, it's really large and constantly being updated. So according to the web tool, the most used dissemination theory is the diffusion of innovation. In 1962, E.M. Rogers published a book called Diffusion of Innovations, where he sought to explain how over a period of time, an idea or a product gains momentum and diffuses or spreads through a targeted population. Through his research, Rogers discovered that the adoption of new ideas was a process, one in which some people are more likely to adopt new ideas easier or faster than others. As a result, five adopter categories were identified, the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and the laggers, which are my favorite because on the screen, this guy wants his fax machine back, which is fantastic. Um, in our work, we are often the innovators, right? Through reports, through manuscripts and presentations, we diffuse our work to early adopters, those who like shiny new things, right? To, but to cross the chasm where the shark is sort of circling um, and to reach those early and late majority, we need to actively disseminate our work. Um, who lives in this group uh, of the early and then late majority? These are our administrators, right? Our policymakers and the public. So another commonly used dissemination theory is from the world of marketing and it's called social marketing theory. Social marketing applies marketing principles to societal objectives, such as improving the health and welfare of individuals and society. And this is rather than corporate objectives. So the theory guides the user to design their dissemination strategy based on four Ps, product, price, place, and promotion. Product refers to the research findings being disseminated. You know, the way you package and present your quality improvement or research findings 
should be designed by and for your audience who know their local context better than we do. Price refers to the cost in time and money to your audience for seeing your product. So if your research findings are behind a paywall or require multiple steps to access, this is a limiting factor. Place is how you um, how your target audience receives and accesses your research findings. So the ideal is for audiences to invest minimal effort to retrieve product information. Ideally, your work arrives in their inbox, right? Or social media feed, and it just catches their eye. Um, and then the last P is promotion, which guides you to consider the different methods of communication. And these can range from low touch methods, such as social media, uh, radio, uh, internet messages. And, and these subliminally promote your work without people knowing they're being influenced. High touch methods include <laughs> some of our favorite in healthcare, right? Like hanging posters, um, attending community forums and distributing printed materials. Uh, these allow for face-to-face -face interactions, but they limit how many people you can ultimately reach. So in 2020, our team at the uh, Dissemination uh, Research Core at CCTSI, uh, we published a dissemination planning workbook that is guided by the diffusion of innovation and social marketing theories. So this open access resource is available on the CCTSI webpage, and we use this to guide our dissemination consultations. So we encourage teams to work through this early, right? So they can establish their dissemination goals, um, select their target audiences, because there are probably are multiple, and then develop dissemination strategies appropriate for their different audiences. Uh, your dissemination approach um, may change over the course of the project, especially something like a two or three year you know, um, program, but doing this work up front is a very beneficial exercise to get everyone on the same page. Okay, so I'm gonna move into some of the tips and best practices that we have um, started to share with our consult, uh, consultees, I guess you'd say, the clients that we work with. Um, and uh, we started the consult service in 2021 to build dissemination capacity uh, for CCTSI members who work across the clinical and translational spectrum. And this is one of our recruiting infographics. And we have talked with basic scientists from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, um, from uh, CU Boulder. We've worked with veterinary science um, uh, scientists at Colorado State University, and then also many uh, quality improvement and researchers doing really important work in the fields of public health and also in hospitals. So the example I'm going to use uh, is in a is a concept we uh, did with an assistant professor at CU Boulder who just had a new study funded, um, and I call her Dr. Luck, right? Because anyone who gets funded is, is lucky. Um, Dr. Luck works with a large team that studies the role of the microbiome and mental health, and they have multiple papers to share and want to move their work towards clinical and policy impact, and also share that they just got funded for another uh, phase of their their studies. So the specific objectives for her team's consultation was to learn how to increase their web presence, how to engage with colleagues in online communities, and how to create engaging visual materials. So developing a web presence has benefits, right? The personal benefits of creating an online profile for yourself are to distinguish yourself from other clinicians, scientists, and researchers, right? Especially if you share a name with others in your field or your name is tricky to spell. Um, another benefit is to automatically link your professional activities and publications and presentations to yourself. And also um, it can help facilitate collaboration and it can make it easier to assess the impact of your work uh, um, for grants, right? If they ask that in the section uh, on reports and then also for promotion. The professional benefits of creating an online profile include that your work is more likely to be found, right? It, and then read and then discussed and then ideally shared again and amplified online. Um, you can connect with collaborators around the world and you can engage in scholarly discussion if you're interested in doing so. And you can find jobs, right? Or speaking engagements and also consultant opportunities. 
So the first thing we discussed with Dr. Luck and her team is that everyone should sign up for an open researcher and contributor ID, which is uh, also called an ORC ID. So ORC ID provides a persistent digital identifier that you own and control, and that distinguishes you from every other person out there. You can connect your ORC ID with your professional information. So any affiliations, grants, publications, peer reviews that you've done and more. Uh, you can use your ID to share your information with other systems, ensuring you get recognition for all your contributions. And that saves you time and hassle and reduces the risk of errors. I use this most when I'm submitting papers to journals um, to make sure all my information is correct every time. So the next thing we discussed was that everyone should create a Google Scholar profile. Um, Google Scholar provides a single way, excuse me, a simple way to broadly search for scholarly literature beyond what you would find in PubMed. Google Scholar profiles are a simple way for authors to showcase their publications. You can check who is citing your articles, you can graph citations um, over time and compute several citation metrics. So I've included a screenshot of my user profile uh, once you click on that, you'll see all my work. And this can be sorted by title, by year, by number of citations for each publication. The other cool thing is that the, um, the profiles ca uh, calculates a platform dependent H index to track the impact of your research, which is what is graphed on this slide. Um, and this is helpful when you ask people to write you letters of recommendation, plus when you're submitting your annual review or a tenure packet. Plus, when someone Googles you, such as your peers, right, journalists, funders, or community partners, data from your Google Scholar profile that you are create, uh, curating will pop up. So the next thing we discussed with Dr. Luck and her team was to look at her professional profile, which is hosted by um, the university, and to make sure it's up to date. So for the team, we encourage them to develop a program web page that they can refer people to so they can learn more about the team, the work, any events, trainings, even recruit participants um, and, and you know leave educational materials for people to access on their own without you having to send them. So we've worked uh, at CCTSI, we've worked extensively with Dr. Jennifer Stevens Lapsley. Um, and here are two examples from her website. So the first is just the basic University of Colorado School of Medicine um, profile. And the second is the research team website, which is also hosted by the university. So um, I looked at the Stanford Medicine sites and uh, many people have blank profiles that could be easily updated to ask to act as a professional web page. So at, at, a, at the beginning of it, just even make sure that all your titles are correct. <laughs> um, but once you've curated your page and hopefully added in highlights and maybe some cool graphics or some links to presentations, we suggest uh, that you share that personal link on your email tagline, um, business cards, if you still do those, and any social media bios so that people can go there to learn more about your work. But this is entry level, right? If a team has the time and resources, we encourage them to build out a professional looking website to act as a single source for all your program materials. So the second request from Dr. Luck was to set herself up to engage with colleagues online. So why should we all be participating in online scholarly communities? Um, the first reason is because it helps us to stay up to date, right, on news and publications in our field. It comes seamlessly into our, our social media feed or into our inboxes and boom, we get to see it, right, instead of having to go look. Um, it can increase the visibility of our work and stay connected to the field. It can help us engage with colleagues and establish um, our expertise in a particular subject area. And it can help um, you develop a platform to disseminate your work to colleagues and to the general public. We encourage people to do this before they have something to share because you need to build your audience. So we encourage Dr. Luck and her team to look to um, social media platforms. And you know <laughs> these are changing by the day, right? But depending on your audience, maybe they're on Facebook, maybe they're on Twitter X, maybe they're on LinkedIn, maybe they're on Snapchat, right? And um, if they're there, that's where you can go and have um, some scholarly communication. 
it's okay to just read for a while as well, just to see who's out there and what what types of conversation are there. But eventually we encourage people to share something and include a link right to your amazing web uh, website so people can um, then reach out to learn more. But this is just the tip of the dissemination pyramid. We also encourage Dr. Locke to submit their work to online news outlets, um, such as the New York Times Upshot or The Conversation, right, to get national exposure. Um, blogging and being a guest on a podcast or other options to share your work with new audiences. Last, of course, is the bedrock of scientific dissemination, which is the peer-reviewed literature. And Dr. Luck had actually developed a report for a national group and for some of her funding partners, and we encouraged them to submit that for peer-reviewed publication. <laughs> so by this time in our consultation, which is usually about 45 minutes, people can be a bit overwhelmed. So we tell them to take, you know, on one of these things at a time. You don't have to do them all, but ultimately it depends on the dissemination goals and the audience that you set um, when you started working on your, your whole program. So the last request from Dr. Luck was for guidance on how to create visually engaging materials, right? To help her share her work on her website, in presentations, and again, on social media. And this is when we talk about visual abstracts, infographics and videos. So a visual abstract is a visual summary of the key findings of a study, a report, or a publication. So like the executive summary of a report, it conveys the most essential points in a shorter format. It does not replace reading the full article, right? It serves to point out key pieces and to hook a reader to generate interest to go into your link and find your actual peer reviewed literature or web page or, or whatever. So a visual abstract um, can be built in PowerPoint and there are toolkits that can teach you or a member of your staff to do this without too much effort. Uh, they are fantastic on social media and I've seen them used in presentations and I've actually even seen them as scientific posters. Um, I recommend going to Dr. Andrew Ibrahim's website, which is um, on the slide, surgeryredesign.com, who um, created the visual abstract um, back in 2016. Uh, he is an architect and surgeon at the University of Michigan. And um, he has done a fair amount of science to show that the use of visual abstracts actually increases you know, people who are reading um, your articles and ultimately citing your articles as well. So his open source primer is a surgeon's journey, uh, is posted at a surgeon's journey through research and design, and it's a, it's a must read. So Dr. Luck had some funding and was interested in creating infographics, which present complex scientific information at a level that diverse audiences can understand. So these can boost engagement and provide entry-level education about your work. They also look great on social media, um, in a newsletter or blog, and I have seen them picked up by news outlets. So if you're watching the news at your gym and your visual abstract or your infographic shows up and they're speaking to that, that is a successful dissemination moment. Um, there are soft pro software programs available for um, you to create these on your own. Um, and uh, we can talk about that in the um, Q&A section if you have an interest in knowing about those. or um, you can also uh, work with graphic designers, right? You can get them um, online. You can contract with folks online through like Upwork or Fiverr, or ideally there might be some graphic designers in your department. There are very talented people out there in your marketing and communication departments who might you know, be looking for something to do like this. Okay, so she was also interested in videos and videos require design help, right? This is not something you can do on your own. But they can be an effective dissemination method that can break down complex topics into language and visuals that pretty much anyone can understand. So one of my favorite explainer videos is by Dr. Aaron Carroll, who writes, uh, who co-writes the Incidental Economist blog. And he does a great job of explaining why you should actively disseminate your work. And so I am going to play this video because he sort of summarizes what I've talked about and then takes it to the next step and in you know six minutes, which is super impressive. So I'm going to play this video for you all. It might be a little loud, so be ready. From 1856 to 1864, Gregor Mendel conducted his experiments with pea plants. Spoiler, remarkable success, defined genetics. 
1865, he presented his findings at the Natural History Society of Brno. In 1866, he published his findings in an academic journal. Then he went back to work. From 1866 to 1900, his paper was cited four times. Four! This was groundbreaking work in genetics, and no one knew anything about it. Mendel did very little to change that, so it wasn't until the 20th century that his contribution was rediscovered, and he was already dead. Publishing a paper is not enough. I'm talking to you people in science. This episode is totally directed at you. This may seem self-serving coming from me and healthcare triage, but we're gonna make an argument for more of you to do what we do, disseminate. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. In 2009, two researchers did a quantitative analysis of research represented in mass media. They showed that from 1990 through 2001, more than 650,000 papers were published. No more than 0.34% of them were ever covered in mass media, however, and almost all of those were health-related. If you were in the other areas of science, guess what? No one knows about your research. The flawed academic dissemination model goes like this. We publish a paper. We maybe put out a press release. Maybe, if we're lucky, we do a couple interviews, and then we go back to work. That doesn't work. In 2006, more than 1.3 million peer-reviewed articles were published. That's like one every 30 seconds. No one will see your article unless it's in a major, and I mean major, journal. It's massively counterintuitive, or it just happens to be what's going on in the news right now. There's a better way to do it. Who cares when your work is published? You can't change if it's in a major journal. You can't change if it's massively counterintuitive. But you can wait to push it when it's newsy. Wait until your topic of interest is in the news already, and your particular contribution makes more sense to do a media push. Or make news yourself. Write an editorial or commentary. Write a viewpoint. Write a perspectives piece. Guess what? Those are what people read in the journals anyway. It's even what most journalists read. You can even write a piece for a lay audience about your work and pitch it yourself to major newspapers and websites. Journalists and others definitely read those. And speaking of journalists, stop being so afraid of them. Unlike many of us introverts in science, they like talking to people. I know, they like talking to experts. You're an expert. Talk to them. Develop relationships with them, even if it's just on background. Be available to them to talk about the work of your field, even if it's not yours. Then, when you have your own work to push, you already have a relationship set up. Will you go further? Commit to writing the occasional column. Come up with whatever schedule you think will work, or even consider blogging. Write about what's important to you more often. Become a voice that people listen to. If doing it yourself is too daunting, you can blog with other people. If that's too daunting, consider contributing to someone else's blog. They're probably looking for good content. They'd be thrilled to take it from you. If blogging isn't for you, try radio. There are shows all over the place that need expert content. Volunteer to appear. You'll be shocked how many people will take you up on it. You know what else works to get the word out? Video, like this. While I've got your attention, let's be honest about the downsides of doing all of this. It's not very likely that you will get a lot of academic credit for it. It's an and, not an or, to your regular work. You might be able to claim it as service in the academic world, but it's not going to qualify as research. The real world moves at a much faster pace than academic journals. You are much more likely to get scooped while preparing for a media outlet than a journal. On the other hand, it is more likely that multiple outlets will take similar work, including one's own blog, so nothing need go to waste. With exposure can come brutality in the form of hate tweets and irate emails. Expect more of this if you stick your neck out. Some people find this to be a minimal irritant and easily ignored. For others, it could be significant, especially considering the tendency for women and minorities in the public eye to attract internet trolls. Additionally, exposure risks irritating colleagues by visibly sticking out positions they might not favor or by, no doubt inadvertently, overlooking their work. And know this, there's not a lot of money in it. Don't do it for that reason. But the upsides are totally worth it. You're doing research because you think you have something to contribute. I bet you do. If people don't understand what you do, or don't understand your field, what's the point of it all? You have skills, skills that not a lot of people have. You have special knowledge too. Share it. I bet you have something to say. I bet you're passionate about that, so do so. 
If you don't, then it's like the work didn't happen. You got into this game to make the world a better place. Doing the research is necessary, but not sufficient. Mendel cracked genetics, and no one knew about it for decades. That's not only tragic for him, advances and leaps forward were delayed for decades because no one knew. When it comes to disseminating your work, don't be Mendel, be better. Do you like the show? <laughs> Always helps if you like. All right. Um, he's one of my favorites. and But, you know, that's the impact of a video. and. If you have the money and the resources, you know, it is a really effective dissemination. From 1850. Oh. Okay, so in summary, uh, today I reviewed, along with Dr. Carroll, uh, why you should actively disseminate your work. Um, I presented some dissemination tools and frameworks to help you guide your work, because it can feel overwhelming without those type of frameworks. Last, I went through a consultation with Dr. Luck and uh, where we discussed how to develop an online presence, engage in online communities and create engaging visual visuals. Um, hopefully you now, you know, are feeling like on a scale of one to 10, you're like a six, or maybe a seven, right? Thinking I'm going to do this. Um, and I usually leave a chunk of time because if I can get you to like an eight or nine by the end of this talk, uh, that would be great. So I will open ourselves up to some question and answers. But before I do, I just want to put in a plug that Stanford Medicine is partnered with the Stanford Center for Clinical and Translational Research and Education, which is also a translational science hub um, like the one we have at University of Colorado. And they are a fantastic resource for education, uh, for um, trying to figure out how to engage new audiences uh, to share your work amongst many, many other things. So uh, if you have not uh, engaged with this group, I highly recommend it. Um, so here's my contact information. And again, I'm, I'm pleased as pie to have um, shared uh, this talk with you all. And I am now open for conversation because it's a bit of a controversial topic. People get a little heated around dissemination for some reason. Thank you, that was great. Um, and yes, put questions in the chat or hop, hop off mute if you have a question, um, but to get uh, ourselves rolling, uh, my question is, do you have like a rule of thumb about how much resources we should plan for these activities for, let's say, a NIH type grant? Like how much post after the study should you have uh, devoted to this type of activity? So most grants now, at least federal grants, require a dissemination section, right? So you have to outline what you're going to do. And it used to be okay just to say, I'm going to publish a, one to three papers in these journals, right? Ideally sort of uh, different ones. I will attend a couple of my professional societies and give talks and I will engage uh, my community partners once. And that is no longer acceptable. Now they do wanna see that you will engage audiences on social media, that you will potentially build out a sustainable website so that your work will be available to the public when the grant ends. And so um, when you write those things, you should develop a budget for those. Social media is more or less free, but if you decide to create a logo, which is super fun to do with the color schemes, you, you know, if you get that professionally done, that's going to cost you, you know, a hundred to $300. And then if you decide you want to do infographics or, or visual abstracts, um, it, get a designer engaged early and start, you know, creating that content. Again, that's budgetary. Some of them can be quite, graphic designers can be expensive. And then if you wanna do videos along the way, you know, those are budget. So we usually recommend um, anywhere between one and $3,000 in your, in your grant budget for dissemination efforts. In addition to traveling to conferences and paying for open access publications, right? So that's what we recommend. We've, we work with a lot of um, Colorado scientists putting in grants on their dissemination section and then their budgets. And then they they actually write us into their grants um, as consultants, right? So again, over a, a five-year grant, your, your project's gonna change. So if you can write in and we will consult periodically with a dissemination expert, you know, that section's gonna get a thumbs up. Thanks, Sam. Great guidelines. Anyone in the audience, feel free to jump on in with a question. So I'd love to do a show of hands. Um, who currently has a uh, social media account that has a picture on it and they've actually 
accessed it in the last seven days. So just you can just raise your hand. Okay, see a couple mm -hmm. people. But not an overwhelming majority. Would anyone like to share their experience of being of sharing their science on social media? Whatever platform. I am plas platform agnostic because it depends on your audience. And if I don't hear from anyone, I'm going to call on my friend, Dr. Lucy Houghton, who's in the audience and is willing to come off and I have a feeling. You can absolutely call on me. <laughs> so, so I would say for me, I'm on three different platforms, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. And um, they all have a bit of a different tilt. And so I shape my messaging according to the tilt that they have. Um, but what I have found, and this is after going um, and receiving some really um, amazing training from Laura Macaris, who was the social media um, person for Barack Obama and Seventeen Magazine. So not from my own thoughts here. Um, but what she really shared with me is that um, you have to look at it in two, diff two different ways. So to be able to engage as a nurturing thing from those who are already following your work. So you want to give them some tips and ways to apply and things that they can do to move your um, work forward. And then there's the other side of it of how to draw in people um, who are not currently following you, um, but you know how to get your work in front of them. And so those are two different methodologies of how to um, engage in social media. I love that, thank you. Anyone else want to share their social media experience? Because that tends to be, most people, I think, in science, we tend to be observers and potentially not engaged. Can I chime in? Yes, please. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Heather. This is a really great um, chat. Full disclosure, I work really closely with Sam um, in the Evaluation Sciences Unit. So, um, but I, I, but I'm super excited to um, to hear your talk. And I had had a really great experience um, on Twitter, um, and actually used it. And so, this is a question. I had used it to live tweet some um, conferences which was great because it was nice to be able to kind of have those notes available. Um, and then I got followed by folks at the conference. I think for one of the conferences, I was one of the top posters or top being followed, which was super exciting. Um, and then it was Balt and is now X um, and um, and is having like, you know, some reports of like NPR has dropped off of X entirely. And so my, my question is like, I had this great experience. I was feeling really good about things. And then I have concerns about the platform, um, overall and, uh, you know, how do you manage that, um, that kind of stuff? Cause I, I think our social media landscape is going to continue to change, um, uh, you know, either for these reasons or others. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's one that we get often. People, um, our social media landscape is changing, right? I think during COVID, Twitter was a fantastic platform um, for us to share you know, clinical experiences and, and, and science. And yeah, with the new change in leadership and some of the restraints, you know, I think that um, that has changed. However, I have heard from so many colleagues who curate their Twitter um, profile just professionally. So they they don't follow anything else and they, they actually unfollow and block certain things that um, they still have a pretty good scholarly discussion um, at times and especially for conferences. So conference uh, planners still po you know say, please share via Twitter X um, because the other platforms are, have yet to match the, the ease of use. Uh, so 
what we say though is what is your dissemination goal at a conference if you're there to share quick thoughts for people who are not there or to connect with others who are also at the conference then it's probably appropriate um, for you to use the proper hashtags because you know threads doesn't do hashtags right so it's hard to to track based off that 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 platform doesn't work in the same way um, if people are on facebook at a conference that's another option but um so really it depends on what your goal is um most people that I've talked to, they're on there very infrequently. They share an article, they follow some publications and particular scientists. They'll engage heavily during meetings um, and then um, again, not engage after because of what you're saying. But um, some of the, the big thinkers in the field um, say that um, it's time to re-engage in our own original work. So create your website and do and share your way that way. Create communities. Um, uh, blogging is another one, podcasting is another one that um, is less influenced by some of these um, current powers that are using them, maybe not the way they were originally intended. But yeah, Thank more you. to come. It, yeah. It's a bummer because Twitter Thank was you. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And, um, and the like remembering what your goal is. I mean, we can do that. That's what we do in research and quality improvement all of the time. Like what's the goal? What's the goal? What's the goal? So yeah. that's uh, that's a helpful true north. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Just saw a question posted by oh. Noah in the chat. Would you like to come off mute and ask it? I think I can do that. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. And thanks for the presenter. That's excellent. Uh, I guess I just wanted to know what's the the best way to disseminate the science that we we do in the lab and in social media without necessarily sounding too uh too boastful. You know, the typical social media environment is more of you know showing off and showing off of things you don't claim. But at the same time, you want to do it in a way where uh, the science is presented in a very accurate way. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you reach uh, many people. So it's kind of uh, hard sometimes to find that fine line. How do we do that without falling on one side to do it too little or not doing it too much you know thank you yeah this is I love this question because you know it's okay to boast about your incredible work um it's not like you're boasting about your new car and I think maybe we just have to reframe it you're informing and you're informing with a positive bent because we as humans are more drawn to positive than we are to negative though the news media prefers you know headlines that bleed. So if you can reframe that to say, how do I share my work in a positive frame so that people will lean into it and think, I want to know more. That Some might say that's boasting, but I would say as scientists, we have to fill the void. We have to talk about science. Peter Ho um, Hoetz um, from uh, Texas, he's a, a vaccine scientist, and he's been giving talks around the nation this year talking about that we as scientists, if we don't talk about our work and, and boast about our work, um, and the, and the truth, truths of science, as will fill that void, who should not, who don't have our knowledge, and they do it quite well, right, with vaccine myths and, um, you know, which is he's trying to battle. So, um, that that's just a mind frame. The other way to do this, though, Noah, and and one that I've loved um, seeing done is that if you have a mentor who is on social media, um, they post about your work. They're bragging on your behalf. Your department chair is posting your work. You write it, but they boast and and they you know they don't say my mentor. They say I am. I want to share this incredible work coming um, out of you know our group, and then they tag you, and then you can follow up on it. So it's not so much that you're talking about yourself. Someone's inviting you to talk. So if you have a mentor, if you have um, an advisor or a senior scientist in your in your um, world who already is on social media, ask them to promote your work, and then you take it from there. Um, we also do things at the University of Colorado where um, our, you know, CCTSI has its own social media feed. So people who are, don't even want to be on social media, we do the work for them. So we boast about their work to get it out there. And then we tag people like myself and my colleague, Bethany Kwan, who are on social media. And then Bethany and I, and I amplify these folks who just for all the wrong, excuse me, for all the right reasons, just, just don't want to, don't want to engage. Um, does that answer your question? It did. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I, I think uh, overall, we've been very, at least myself, been very shy and not 
I don't want to sound too boastful uh, in the science field. And so it's helped to hear that we should try to be a little bit of that in order to share the message. So thank you. Humility is an admirable trait. However, when you are trying to sell your work, you never hear someone saying, well, this is the second best car on the lot. So you should definitely think about it. You know, they're like, this is the best car on the lot. And so dissemination science is based off of sales and marketing. And so um, put that hat on when you're starting to think about it. Um, yeah, and then supporting and elevating each other's work. Um, we have folks in the VA who do that brilliantly. Dr. Ash, if he's still on, is one of the greatest. He uh, he started a, a social media presence a long time ago and really brought out voices of some of us um, up and comers. Uh, and it was just the coolest thing to all of a sudden see someone had cited your work um, and then you got to start, continue the conversation. So if you have that platform, please use it for others. Interesting discussion. And along with that, um, so I always think of like studies coming out in terms of like the publications as in like your packaged messages or your packaged results. Um, do you have team, do you encourage teams to think about this uh, around every single publication or is it like their most exciting message they wanna get out is what they're promoting? and making the infographics and going to the media with? So many journals now require infographics or, or visual abstracts. Some journals, you know, New England Journal will do one for you, um, but others ask you to do that and they will help promote it for you. So I would suggest that anything that you publish, that is the bedrock of our science. You should promote it and you should promote it in every way possible. But, you know, for instance, Dr. Luck, we, we joke, she's got a team, right? She is not out there doing it by herself. She might be the one who submits the, um, the sort of the draft to the conversation, right? Which is a free open source academic driven um, journal. Uh, you work with journalists who will help you fine tune it. She might take that on, but you know, doing blog posting, doing blog posts or updating the website, she might hand that off to others. And then, um, you know, after her talking with her team, she found a bunch of young postdocs who have a social media presence. They're on TikTok, and they started creating mini TikTok videos of all of their publications, link them together into this coolest thing, right? So if you don't talk about it, and for these postdocs, that then was an opportunity for them to enter the field of dissemination science. And um, and some of them actually have come to our University of Colorado DNI training um, because I think the next generation appreciates that um, it's going to be hard to find your audience and you know and carve your way into um, the existing level of full professors and funded scientists, right? So um, they're going to have to actively disseminate. an interesting world we're headed into. Opening up, anyone else, any other questions? I have a question for Dr. Gilmartin. I'm, I'm curious because my last publication, uh, I was asked to make a TikTok video and I'd never had that experience before. And I'm just wondering if that's something that you're starting to see as well of these, you know, uh, not just those infographs or um, the visu visual um, abstracts, but also this, this inquiry around how um, we're posting on social media. Yeah. So uh, the, it's it's not required, but yeah, there are, people are doing innovative things. I have yet to hear someone being told they have to do a TikTok, but you know, you turn to your neighbor's teenager or your own teenager, you know, and you say, "Help me explain this." It's no different than um, when you're when you're writing an executive summary or trying to come up with your value proposition, right? Um, you're meant to go to your family and say, "Does this make sense?" And if they say, "I have no clue what you're talking about," right? You haven't explained it well enough. Same thing. If Can I sell this over a TikTok, over Snapchat, which I don't even know how to get on to Snapchat, right? But if I, if I had a Snapchat community, 
I would, uh, audience, I would go find my teenagers and say, hey, put me on there. And uh, that's the next generation. So, you, and have fun with it. I mean, this is like silly stuff. It can be so fun uh, versus, you know, writing that last page of your discussion that you just want it to be done. That's a, all the hard work is done. And now you get to create pictures and images. And as, as like Aaron Carroll said, um, you know, reach out to, to journalists. They want to talk to us. And if we don't do that, they're going to talk to people who they shouldn't be talking to. Uh, and, you know, have some fun with it. <laughs> anyway. Science is too serious anyway. We have to have a little bit of fun. Agree. Um, and I do you have any recommendations for reaching out to journalists. Um, so I mean, I, I'm a reader of the New York Times. Uh, I'm a born and bred New Yorker. And so they have their bylines there for a reason. And so you can um, get on there and you can reach out. And I've, I've done it a couple times. I have a colleague and I were fighting to get a letter of the editor uh, into the, the New York Times and neither of us have done it yet. But, you know, you just you just reach out and say, I have an, a thought or an opinion if you're interested. And, and the worst that they can do is not respond. But they're definitely not going to respond if you don't reach out. Podcasts as well. Those are fantastic places to go. They need people to talk to. Great. Okay. And you don't have to do hair and makeup if you're on a podcast, right? So like, easy peasy. Awesome. So one more minute. Any last minute questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Gilmartin, for coming and talking to us today. Uh, I think I feel like our group has a lot to think about in terms of dissemination, and I hope this has inspired others. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And I don't have it pulled up, but we should be meeting again in two weeks-ish time. Um, so hope to see you on for our next lecture. But Thank you again, Dr. Gil Martin, and this was wonderful. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Love talking to you guys.